I'll do a brief report, and then after that, I'll, if they have any questions for staff, for me, they'll ask me any questions they may have, and then they'll um, ask you to come up. Okay?
I'd like to uh, call to order this uh, meeting of the Urban Design Commission Wednesday, March 11th, 2009. Um, start off with roll call. Here. 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 And uh, entertain a motion for approval of uh, last meeting's minutes. We don't have minutes, do we? Are there minutes here? I withdraw that request uh, since we don't have minutes, so not entertain a motion for that. Um, item C, special order of business. Are there any disclosures? Mr. Kimmerer? Yes, thank you. Uh, on case 2009-005, Spinard Road Reconstruction, I am the project manager for Land Design North on that uh, case and I asked to be recused from it and also 2000 case 2009031 land design north is the landscape architectural firm for the project and I asked to be recused from that case as well per past precedent it would seem that those um, are good reasons for recusal unless there's someone else that uh, feels otherwise would say be recused if that's appropriate normal chair language <laughs> um, for myself uh, for project 2009 005 um, my firm provided uh, drafting services for a preliminary version of um, this project um, we no longer have any fiduciary um, relationship and the design has changed a, a fair amount since uh, our involvement um, so I'd like to put it in front of the Commission as to whether they uh, feel that I should be recused or not um, so I would put that to um, Commission vote or discussion and unlike uh, we were thinking earlier there is no uh, danger to quorum now should I be recused Oh, your microphone. Um, by, for the first UDC submittal, we did drafting for this. Um, so we were just working with Lounsbury to provide uh, CAD services, essentially, um, involving a very minor amount of design input, but uh, essentially just drafting services. And it uh, has changed since then. Oh, I'm sorry. So given the, uh, you know, the limited uh, involvement uh, that you've had in this project, I'd uh, move that uh, you participate. Is there a second? Okay. 
Um, it's open for voting then. Oh, are there any objections? Hearing none, uh, motion is passed, so I will participate. Um, are there any additional uh, requests for recusal? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Um, and move for approval first. Yeah. I'd like to hear a motion for approval of today's consent agenda. Commissioner Joyner moves and Commissioner Gasick seconds. Or is there any discussion? Mr. Chair. I would like to pull out case 2008-035. For um, the revision of the staff recommendation. Mm -hmm. Any um, objections to that? Um, I guess that's a friendly amendment. Um, that's the same case I was going to ask to be pulled. Okay. Um, any other comments, discussion? Seeing none, is there any objection to approving the consent agenda with the exception of pulling case 2008 035? Seeing no objections, the consent agenda is passed and 2008-035 is moved um, forward to be here now. Um, staff, if you, I, I believe that um, you have some additional comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is uh, a consent agenda item for final landscape review of the 40th Avenue um, right-of-way, public facility right-of-way project. Um, uh, upon speaking with the uh, petitioner, um, uh, we uh, wanted to modify um, uh, three of the conditions. Uh, say modify two conditions and delete one. Uh, that is condition four. We want to add the word consider. Um, before um, consider alternating the uh, installation of tree and shrub masses on both sides, 40th Avenue from stations 21 plus 50 to 21 plus 00. Um, uh, that word consider will uh, give the design team the flexibility to um, uh, leave existing vegetation and work with some changes that are um, happening to the project. Um, condition five, I'd like to um, recommend um, adding uh, one sentence to the end of that condition. It would state, uh, if the location of the fence is moved into the right of way, then it shall be six feet in height or the maximum allowed by code. Um, the purpose of adding this is that uh, the, uh, along this section of right of way, PM&E, Project Management Engineering Department, needs the flexibility to uh, um, uh, install the fence um, in, uh, they haven't figure, figured out uh, which location would serve the public interest best uh, yet. Uh, and then finally, uh, condition number 10 um, is not uh, relevant to, uh, it should be deleted. Um, there are no wetlands that exist within the project area, hence they're not shown on the, the site. Those are the only changes that I have. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, the petitioner does not object to these changes. Any questions for staff or for the petitioner? Is, is the petitioner present? Yes, they are. My name is Kevin Denier. I'm with Dial HKM, landscape architect who did the landscape architecture plans and Brad Milosic from Dow HKM, engineer on the project. Hi, Kevin. I just wanted to make sure that you guys didn't have any objections to the recommendations made by staff or the, the changes that were made. No, we have no objection to those. Thank you. Any further questions? Commissioner Anya? I move to approve case. 2008-435, meeting the requirements for the UTC approval subject to the new staff recommendation. Is there a second? I'll support that. Mr. Kimmer seconds. Is there any discussion? Or would you like to speak to your motion? No, I don't understand. No. 
seeing no discussion, um, are there any objections to the passing of this motion? And seeing no objections, the motion is passed. Commissioner Kemplin, did you have a motion that you wanted to make at this time? I do, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to um, rearrange the agenda to move that uh, number item uh, H, appearance request, uh, be moved forward uh, at this time. To be before the regular agenda? To be before the regular agenda. If you can make that, uh, there you go. <laughs> Is there a second for that motion? Any um, discussion or explanation for that? Well, it's not often that we get an appearance request here before the commission, and I'd certainly like to be responsive to citizens that uh, take the time out of their busy you know, schedule uh, to come to the commission, and sometimes we can um, you know, run a little long. I'd like to give them an opportunity to uh, make their case, make their presentation, and move on. Are there any objections to the agenda change? I'll support it. Sorry? I'll support the motion. Seeing no objections, um, we will change the agenda to have our appearance um, happen now. Um, and if you would uh, state your name and please uh, keep your time to five minutes. Thank you very much for, for changing this order for me. But you know, I just looked at the agenda and it does look so interesting and we have to stick around for one of the, one of the items. We'll see how long it takes. Um, I'm Diane Holmes and I, I asked to appear before you because um, over the last 10 years that I've been part of the 2020 process, which by the way had a great public involvement and in, in visioning of our city, I see us drifting from its goals. I've observed mistakes from an overworked staff, lack of education for boards and commissions, delivered oversight by the administration and staff, and developers lab and efforts. This plus a compounding of errors on the case before PMZ and subsequent plotting were the final straw for me. Well, we've got to do things better than outside for ourselves and because folks aren't moving here to start businesses because of the weather. A valued trail system doesn't offer, often translate at the ballot box. I know your duties have been reordered and we now have the responsibility for occasionally plotting trail pedestrian easements or the like to fulfill certain 2020 policies. Maybe not. But if this is the case, please don't shrink from that duty. And don't feel sorry for any developer who may be crying that easements are a burden. Well, just look at uh, a few of the real estate ads. Anytime a parcel is anywhere near anything green, that becomes a prominent selling point. And such properties can be sold for 20% more than non-green things. And these statistics for this have been laid out very nicely in a report by our city's very own Watershed Management Director. Your staff recommendations, unfortunately, don't always serve you well. Present company accepted. They have missed adjacent trail easements. They don't always cite applicable policies. And our parks plan uh, calls for securing missing green belt parcels and for private public partnerships. Yet, in one case, this like this last fall, this PNZ was told the city couldn't accept such land, even with a willing landowner. 
The same case had a condition against allowing the trail within a wide, steep stream setback because of erosion. Although this condition is attributed to watershed management, the reviewer told me that condition was never part of their original request. In plotting here this case a few years ago, there was a new condition for a trail easement, but the packet lacked the statement for, from the trail's coordinator for an easement perpendicular to a major stream. But citizens asked for it anyway. The developer was willing, but two statements from people about the steepness of the locale killed the deal, and that brings me to my point and the to my main point and the photos. Never, never assume a steep slope can't be accessed. You aren't a trail designer. It's a specialized profession. It's not available by anyone at public works or planning, and few consultants have that talent. Please Make sure you are educated and you get the full information when things come before you. I know this is a bit out of, out of your, a bit different than P and Z and, um, and plotting, but something may become before you. Get the education, insist on complete information, and never make assumptions. Let the designer, uh, uphold the policies of 2020 for pedestrian easements and let the designers work out the details. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Does anyone on the commission have any uh, questions or? No. Um, moving on to the regular agenda, um, case number 2009-005. Landscape plan for Spinard Road reconstruction project. Bernard Road between the Chester Creek and Hillcrest Drive. <coughs> if we could uh, hear staff um, comments on this. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. This project was before the Planning and Zoning Commission last Monday. At that time, they requested that the um, PMNE consider uh, a way to be found to complete the trail connection from the parking lot to the uh, Chester Creek Trail. At that time, P&E uh, mentioned that they were going to try and uh, find the funding to do that connection. I think it's only um, a section of about 255 feet. And I just wanted to update the commission on that. And PMNE may have more on that for us this evening. There is a uh, very little in the way of landscaping in this uh, project. I won't go on to, won't go into the various uh, site design elements that are detailed in staff's report. Due to the limited right of way, little landscaping is provided. The three clusters of birch trees north of Hillcrest Drive offer the only landscaping along this section of the roadway. A small planting area is proposed at the northwest corner of Spinard Road and Hillcrest Drive intersection. The raised planting bed shows one birch tree and 15 Ragosa Rose shrubs. Um, one condition was number three, the, birch, the paper birch tree shall be nursery grown and shall be specified at a half crown height to half, half trunk height. Um, I earlier found out today that the new mass specifications have a similar um, specification in there, so I will uh, be looking at those. And for now, from now on, when we see birch trees, um, I will probably refer the mass specification that they meet that mass specification. That's all I have. If the petitioner has a presentation or information, or sorry, are there any questions for staff? If the petitioner wishes to present. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the commission, my name is Dwayne Adams. I'm with Land Design North. We're a sub-consultant to Lounsbury Engineers, who's a prime consultant with for project management and engineering on this project. This is uh, the initial portion of construction uh, for a, a larger project, but the only one that is now moving forward. Uh, 
the uh, municipal assembly requested that uh, other portions of the project be delayed and uh, reevaluated. So what we bring before you tonight is only that portion from Hillcrest Drive to the north connecting to Chester Creek. Uh, it is still part of Spinard Road. It is a piece that connects up to um, L Street or I Street. And uh, it's a very important piece of, of, of work. Uh, this project will do a number of things. Uh, first of all, it will improve safety going down that hill with a, a, uh, a reasonable uh, surface and curb gutter uh, guardrail uh, combined with uh, Jersey barrier uh, modified aesthetically and uh, uh, a separated trail for the most part and we're not separated, protect, uh, pedestrians are protected by the Jersey barrier and a, uh, a cable railing. So it's a, it's a vastly improved setting for pedestrians and it does now provide the connection from Chester Creek to Spinard. Spinard is a rapidly developing entertainment district is uh, what you might call it, uh, with Beartooth and uh, a lot of the, the small cafes that have developed in the area. This is something that's very appealing to a young mobile crowd and that crowd bikes in the winter, they bike in the summer, they walk, they hike, and they're very active. They're also users of many of the purveyors along the roadway, uh, mountaineering and uh, climbing gear, bicycle gear, kayak gear, uh, uh, vendors, and as a result, it is a much more mobile and different crowd than uh, what we might find in other aspects of Anchorage. In very many ways, it's our university district, really. It's the closest thing we have to a more of a collegiate atmosphere uh, that you might find in college towns. So what this does is, is provide a, a length of roadway uh, where possible, where there's enough room, uh, specifically at the south end, closest to me. Uh, there, are the, there is the vegetation uh, that staff spoke to. Uh, we fit it in as best we can. We also provided an island protected by a curb. We can get a, a tree and some, some uh, color at, a, at an intersection. Uh, one thing that we also are doing uh, that you can see here is a wayfinding column. And this is something that's interjected in the full design should this actually go all the way to Benson Boulevard. But this wayfinding column basically uh, starts uh, with the sense that this is uh, at least coming from Hillcrest, a gateway into this entertainment district if, you, if we continue that, that thought. Uh, close up of that uh, better presented here. This is hit looking from Hillcrest and going down the road. And what you can see is it, it's basically a vertical column, stainless steel with uh, uh, lucite inside uh, lighting, internal lighting that allows uh, manipulation of the light using LEDs so that we can get some color there. It highlights the intersection uh, by denoting uh, by the, the, the lighting that, that comes out both winter and summer that uh, it's a very active, it's a pedestrian area, and it, it adds, I think, uh, some unity to the street with the replication of this as we hopefully move forward with the rest of the project that continues through this portion, this very active entertainment area, if you if you will, uh, to the south. And so it, and each of these is a little different. It's a sculpture in quality. Uh, anyone that's been to the Fairbanks Airport may see similar uh, uh, sculpt it, sculpture there at the entrance to the airport, but this recognizes that in the winter we'd like to have some light coming out and emanating so it's a, a full season piece of, of, of art. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer your questions. I do have uh, one uh, point, and that is that uh, third, uh, well, uh, before I get to that, uh, uh, it is correct, we are working with PM&E and, &E uh, and Parks Department to uh, provide for a connection that will go all the way to Chester Creek so that we avoid putting people in, in uh, harm's way by having to direct them to a parking area. With respect to uh, the recommendations, uh, it's not so much uh, we have no problem with the, the third condition, paper birch or subby nursery going to specify a half crown height to half trunk height. I think what we're saying is top top half green green is what we're saying. Uh, but with respect to the mass uh, specification, uh, which requires balancing in how that's provided, it does raise the issue with respect to whether this is appropriate as a, a, 
a condition of approval uh, and does a specification cover that and being specific with respect to one uh, tree and is that half, is that the right dimension made there, there is some discussion and given the makeup of this commission it would be I think very appropriate to get some input and discuss that because that, as was mentioned uh, there will be something that comes up in other ones and whether it should be there is probably something that merits a little bit of discussion anyway. With that I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for the petitioner? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Campbell? Yes, um, um, Duane, I'm kind of curious, uh, you, uh, uh, in your presentation you talked about the wayfinding uh, column and about its uh, benefits and I was wondering, so, so you, am I to understand then that uh, you consider uh, these type of design elements to be a part of the landscaping for the project? I do definitely. I think landscaping that it uh, often is confined to the issue of plantings, but I, I think if you look at the term landscape, it, the root landscape is is uh, those facets of the earth that are viewed by by a viewer, and and so that's the landscape. It, it doesn't just stop and start with a plant. So uh, I think it is in the purview of this commission to look at those items. If that's the question. Oh, that's good. I uh, just want to clarify that. Um, and uh, also, uh, given uh, that, and um, uh, how does this, as you're talking about a wayfinding column, uh, is are the vertical elements that are being um, installed or considered for installation along this corridor, uh, does the ones that are being shown uh, in this segment, um, do they uh, are there ones that are going to be replicated throughout or are there others in the other sections of the corridor that are not going to be replicated or not seen in this section? Just wanted to kind of get a sense of you know, how this uh, segment uh, relates to the other you know, segments. Uh, through Chair Mr. Kemplin, uh, I believe there's a total of four of these that are proposed along this, this area, 37th Avenue. There's a crossing point. Uh, there will be Potentially, if the project progresses, uh, a, uh, a column there that would highlight that as a crossing point and mm -hmm. kind of signify that. They also one at Fireweed and also one uh, at uh, Northern Light, no, Benson, actually, because there is a feature there at uh, Northern Light. So those are, those are the four key points. And they really, I think, are areas that uh, don't have a lot of competition with clutter because one thing we want to avoid is uh, adding clutter to the area. One of the pro project goals is to reduce the clutter by providing a defined edge that's produced by fencing and walls so that uh, drivers have a clear understanding of where traffic movements are. One of the problems with Spinard is that uh, amidst all the clutter caused by uh, features such as numerous driveways, signage, uh, numerous driveways and uh, unfortunately uh, $300,000 worth of ornamental lights that didn't clean it up but instead actually uh, I think added yet more clutter and overhead uh, power lines you, you got a, a roadway that's hard to read and that, that illegibility is the term we use makes it very difficult for a motorist to actually uh, see the signage which much of it is very architectural and actually adds to the ambiance of the, the roadway and so all that gets lost. A lot of that's going to be cleaned up with edges and in those areas where we aren't competing for attention that's where these will be located particularly where uh, pedestrians will be, be crossing. This is one of the first ones, the north one they will be constructing is kind of the termination of that urban type development. The others, uh, other four uh, are to the south, other three are to the south uh, fundamentally, it's just kind of a reference to the existing uh, well-known sign there at Northern Lights Center with a neon that moves up and it kind of captures that thing uh, by reference without being too literal. Yeah. Just one last question, just kind of you know, following up on that, uh, you know, the clutter and um, as you were talking about the lighting uh, for the gateway element and how, uh, you, know, you know, providing some, uh, you know, enhancement of the winter, you know, uh, environment. Um, 
I was wondering if you gave some thought to uh, was there a, a design element that could um, using uh, lighting that could um, that is uh, integrated uh, into the landscaping along the corridor that helps to uh, provide more of a subdued or a, a continuity. Um, uh, I know, that, uh, um, you know a lot of the in, the in the commercial area, you get a lot of very vibrant colors. For example, a lot of yellows and oranges and reds to, to uh, get people's attention. Uh, and um, you know, one of the ways of uh, offsetting that would be then to you know, use lighting that is more of a warmer, you know, subdued color, you know, the greens, and, and so that. Um, and I was just wondering if you'd given it any thought or if there's any consideration of that. Well, the, the street lighting would be LED natural uh, white light is the intention that, that the city is now going to. There will be light fixtures down this for that lighting, which will also light the, the trail. Uh, down this area, there hasn't been consideration of that. This is the one element mm -hmm. where the budget and, and also just the recognition that we we're moving from an urban very urban, vibrant space down into a natural green space uh, with a number of views, and uh, we don't want too much light down there because uh, uh, one of the concerns, for example, is that we position these not just for the, uh, to make sure we got good illumination and a appropriate distribution of light, but also that we locate them so that they aren't in the views of specific windows in those homes down there. So we've been very careful about keeping the light to a name that's required and the only place we've suggested it is at this location. So, I know I said that was the last one, but just a May, one more. So, so the sort of the Jersey barriers that you are recommending, you know, with the uh, little trellis above it, you weren't given any thought to maybe adding a lighting element, a subdued lighting element along that in some form or fashion? Well, there's, there's a couple facets to that. Uh, the, the barrier walls are not a continuous pour. They're segmented one thing. So there's a connection of how do you make that work. Uh, they do have breaks and stuff. So that, that's one issue. They are also subject to damage. It's a downhill in the area that's known to get a little icy. So that's, that's one concern. They aren't continuous. It, it is a, a small piece. Uh, I believe it's, uh, 600 feet is 400 feet, about 400 feet of wall. Uh, one thing you have to be careful of with barrier walls, uh, uh, you, you can only have so much friction. So the deals or anything like that where you could put, you know, recess the light are not something that's, that's possible mm -hmm. on a jersey bay that meet that, that specific, what they call a safety shape is a, the term that the engineers use. So the ability to modify that is, is uh, constrained to color and you can do some surface treatment, which we're, we're going to try to do possibly. Uh, and we're getting an interpretation. There's various interpretation, but you can even do that. Uh, but as you may well know in the city, there are uh, Jersey Bears that have, Minnesota being one of them, uh, an exposed aggregate finish. So we're, we're looking at that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Commissioner Joyner. Thank you. Um, I had two questions. One on the Jersey barrier. I was trying to picture a aesthetically enhanced Jersey barrier, and I, I didn't quite get the picture. I mean, usually they're one of the least aesthetically pleasing, even though they serve a good function. Are they just going to look like Jersey barriers, but something's on the top of them? Or? Uh, no, to the chair, Mr. Joyner, the... Uh, the wall will be that, what they call again, that safety shape. The jersey has got a number of safety shapes. So it'll be that shape. Uh, they, they will also be segmented at certain intervals. But it, it will be colored. We're looking at an integral color because they, you know, we can't have them manufactured as long as they fit that shape. And we are looking at a, a surface treatment like exposed aggregates. So it's, it's going to be a step up above what you're used to. And the second was just on the trail. Maybe you don't know where that's not part of your project, but is it is it going through the water side of that parking lot? Is that how it connects? Ooh, correct. It would be uh, if we do what uh, we are discuss if we fall through on what our discussions have been with parks. 
it would be on the water side of that parking lot. Yes, it does. There's a new bridge, and so as you may have seen in the plan set, there's a new bridge, and then that bridge has a termination, one that ends right at the parking area, then one that, that goes to the west side of the parking lot, but in the plan set you have it terminates. Planning and Zoning Commission's direction was that that be linked on the west side of that parking lot where the bulbs are right now through to the asphalt trail that serves Chester Creek. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Coleman. Well, this is a great project. I drive this every day. <laughs> Greatly needed. Um, regarding that trail and uh, dumping the bicycles into the parking lot and the uh, staff notes, the trail segment, 255 feet, is not likely to happen for the next eight to 10 years. And they also make a statement that the parking lot is um, not busy. And I guess I uh, differ with that. It's a very busy parking lot. That's where all the young people go to play Frisbee golf. Primarily, they park there. And, and on a, uh, in good weather, that parking lot is full. In fact, the, the cars are actually spilling over out of it, and it, it can create kind of a dangerous situation. I'm wondering, can't they include 250 feet of trail in this project and get that done? Uh, there sure. was concern about putting bicyclists coming down the hill, going across the bridge into that parking area, right, and particularly right at the entrance to the parking lot, you know, where people are going to be turning in there. I, I guess I, I'd suggest they try and find some money to fund 250 feet of trail is not a huge project. Uh, through the Chair, Mr. Coleman, as, as staff noted, that is a condition of the approval by the Planning and Zoning Commission, so PME &E intends to provide that. Good. Commissioner Anya? Yes, I, I want to clarify if the looking to your section DD on, uh, it seems to be that the bike riders are going to share the sidewalk with the pedestrian traffic, is that correct? Uh, through Chair, Mr. Anya. Uh, and for the, the commission's reference, that's on your staff packet, page 29, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, section DD is the standard section that you see as one traveling. You know, at, at the beginning, where the, the trees are shown here to my left, uh, you see that there is this 13-foot uh, landscape buffer. Uh, as you proceed to the very top, uh, where, where it's closest to the top of the boards, at that location, we get into uh, a large fill section, and uh, through there we actually have a, a, a sheet pile wall, that's, or a, excuse me, gabion wall that's going to have to hold that up. And so at that area, we, we can no longer provide that separation. That's the point at which the, the Jersey Bear begins with the cable railing top, and then that continues down. Uh, uh, it's 400 feet, as, as we said, uh, turning uh, just the side of where the, the house is relatively clear. It's that dark line that you see there that finally ends on down the hill. And so that's that's where that, that occurs. And I can go here and show you if that helps, but that may be enough. And so, and then, again, as it gets to the bottom, it starts separating, but there are wetland issues, and we don't want to move into that wetland. Uh, so My question to you will be, if, the, if a person is walking down the hill and then there's a bike coming behind him, right. how is he going to be aware? I mean, because they're going down the hill. Um, right. My experience with the trail is when you are walking all the time, you have those bikes coming up, at least 40 miles per hour behind you, and all the time you are right in the middle of the path, so how can you avoid some kind of conflict. Though. It is one of the issues. The site visibility is good. That's one reason that we did use a cable railing as opposed to anything that would be in the way of the view. Is something that would be it would be very uh, site penetrating, so you could see people down there. But your point is well taken. That on a downhill, uh, pedestrians and bicyclists uh, 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 sometimes that's that's a conflicting use if you have uh, one party or the other that's not paying attention to what's going on. It is a 10-foot wide trail, so it's uh, 
it's a reasonable trail to handle that. Uh, and it is something that the Planning and Zoning Commission talked about quite extensively uh, to the extent that they were looking at whether there should be a sidewalk on the east side of this. The problem is on the east side, you may be aware there's a, a certain Mr. Coleman from driving down there, there's a wall that's painted uh, in an abstract manner. And the problem is if you're a motorist and coming around there, all of a sudden a pedestrian appears out of nowhere uh, especially at night, you won't be able to tell, is that pedestrian in the road prison? Am I going to be there? Or is he on a safe passage? And because of that threat of, uh, and that concern of an inadvertent, uh, breaking action or anything else that might, might send a uh, vehicle awry, they agreed that the single path on the, the west side was appropriate and no other path, uh, was required. Well, um, I explained the trail having been a scary in a couple of occasions, I really was lucky mm -hmm. enough, so and to me it's an accident to happen, so sooner or later we recommend you, you can somehow try to find a way at least to separate and make, make things very clear. Because, uh, yeah, and I agree it would be nice to have a pedestrian path and a, uh, a separated trail for, for bicycles, uh, we didn't figure that one out. The other question I have, I'm also looking to your drawing. L10 at the, at the bottom, when you, your bike path ends. How is the water coming through the road going to get out? Through the, through the sidewalk? And you, are you draining the road? And which shoot is that, Mr. Armour? L10. 10? Yeah. At the end, right up, right on the bridge. Four. Four. Terminus is what he's talking about. There is a, are you talking about? Uh, drain, so the water, the water is going to come down the road. And how are you going to drain? How is the water going, going to get out? Uh, Jennifer, is there a storm drain system? There's a storm drain at the bottom of the hill that collects at that location. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? No. Um, I have a few questions for the petitioner. Um, the lighting fixture that's shown is uh, shown as being a Lumac lighting fixture. Um, so that is the LED and is consistent with the other LED fixtures that are being installed? Correct. Thank you. Um, for your comment on Department recommendation number three. Would you have a request, or uh, uh, you know how it, how it should be worded, or how you would like to see it? Well, uh, our sense is that, that ANSI uh, requires on street trees, which which these are, that it, it be uh, proportional in, in essence it is is what it suggests, and I. I think that's my, my experience, and I understand what the problem is, and it's a well-noted problem, is that uh, particularly where trees are grown close together, and they're harvested and then maybe potted for a short period of time, and so they may or may not qualify as nursery growing, at least for inspection services as it is, what happens is those things are planted, and they, they, because of the competition for light, they've grown very strong, they've shed their bottom uh, stems and leaves, and just so you end up with a, a very tall tree to get that two inch caliper that you're trying to get and, and all that growth, all that green growth is quite high and so that's the problem and we've actually noted that in some of our work and the problem is the people that are doing the inspection are not people that are really geared to uh, inspect the trees often and there's not the enforcement that there needs to be to ensure that the trees meet that standard and uh, they're often not inspected ahead of time and then they're planted and it's a sunk cost and it's not worth arguing with the contractor, it's the end of the project and uh, we've noted this on occasions and nothing ever comes of it. Uh, so it's, it's primarily, I think, an enforcement action. There's nothing there that says that the trees have been planted as, as noted by staff uh, uh, should be allowed. Uh, but even if we change this, my fear is that that doesn't change anything and that the language is, is suitable in, in, that, in the municipality bankers' standard specifications as well as 
uh, suitable in ANSI, but, you know, I, it, it just seems like a matter of we have plant people, you know, people in their plants here and that it knows some discussion because you too, you know, the people here use those specifications and it'd be interesting to know, uh, you know, uh, how you feel about that as well. You'll um, see that on a, another case tonight, as a matter of fact, the same requirement. In regards to um, Mr. Anya's comment on the uh, the pathway, in other areas I've seen where they do actually stripe pathways, um, it's just one visual indication that it's two lanes in a one way. Oh, down the middle, yes. And that is a standard practice, is on downhills, we stripe those, and that's a good comment. And, uh, I don't know that you need to make a motion. It's a, it's a standard practice, but uh, on hills, you'll see that or on corners, mm -hmm. and it's something that's a very reasonable request if you care to make it, though, but I, I do believe that it, that's something that has to happen anyway. And uh, a last um, question, and, and kind of asking to weigh in on something that the, the Commission has been discussing at times. One of the discussions we've been having lately when it comes to uh, uh, community gateway features and um, district elements has uh, been that they've been happening on a lot of projects, um, not necessarily ones that are expansive and really do look at things in a district, but perhaps in just a small neighborhood or a small section of road. One of the concerns that um, has been starting to bubble up is the appropriateness of this um, and at what level we as the uh, UDC, um, you know, weigh in on this and try and provide guidance, uh, the bigger picture element on this. For this, you explained that the features um, do sort of repeat the northern light sign um, the, or at the, the Northern Lights uh, Center. Um, for us, is this an opportunity maybe just to, uh, to say something to us for a couple of minutes? Do you have a certain uh, design take or, um, you know, when would you with a client, you know, sort of caution them against putting in such a distinct element uh, in regards to a big picture or so it, as it's an opportunity to get some in, input from you? Well, I think it, again, in my view, landscape, in Title 21 says landscaping, and it doesn't say planting, so with respect to whether it's a purview, it, in my view, it seem to be, uh, the, uh, with respect to providing guidance on there, and what, uh, when it happens, I think, uh, much like the misbegotten, uh, um, lights on, uh, teardrop lights on Spinelli, that, uh, simply get lost in, in the, all the stuff going on. Uh, you know, it takes a design professional that understands, you know, the organization of elements for that legibility so you can see what's going on. And, uh, you have to be very careful about the application of those. Uh, just as a historic reference, when we worked on, uh, 5th and 6th Avenue, there was, uh, uh, many people have felt that well, we just need a bunch of really fancy lights all up and down 5th and 6th Avenue, a project we worked on many years ago, and we said, well, maybe in a few places, but really what you need to do is get some order to this roadway because there are many parking areas that, you, as a driver, you can't register whether someone's coming out or not. Uh, it's not even edge because some people park on the sidewalks, the full pedestrian width isn't there, and those, those matters are more important, the orderliness of the, the roadway, than anything else. And what that is, is reducing clutter at the point that we start adding clutter and missing the whole point. And so that's why in this one, we aren't looking at every 60 feet to put a repeating element that has, uh, you know, the, the rest of this corridor is that ties it together. We're trying to do that only where it, it's, it's, it can be read and make sense and highlights a point that there might be pedestrians or there's a transition. So it's professional judgment, but it has to be uh, applied very judiciously. Thank you for your input. Commissioner Joyner. I had a comment on Condition 3. Uh, I did notice, um, this is a bigger topic than this, on all of us dollar cases tonight, there were specifications for certain plant species and that struck me as well it's I understand the problem it's addressing that it isn't appropriate for th these and I talked with Ms. Ferguson and also I noticed that Mass has a, come out with a new the standard specifications are online now with uh, much upgraded specifications for plants and there is a crown configuration specification so we talked about from now on referring to mass and those specs and specs written for the project and not have specifications for plants at this level. 
uh, through the treatment center, and this will use the 2009 specifications. So it does do that. And one concern I have is that this is a 2009 specification. It's March. And I hate now all of a sudden having to, to modify all of our specifications as a standard practice when we, we think we've got one that we can work with. So if, you know, with, with staff's consideration as well, can we get what we need with what we have or do we really need another special provision because, uh, you know, it takes time and money and then it's, it's more stuff that's not in the standard spec. The inspectors may or may not be familiar with it. And so special provisions have their, their hazards whenever you use a special provision. Those get lost sometimes. That was my point that it didn't, wasn't appropriate to have specs for specific plants in the recommendation. That's on kind that. of my sense. Leave that to the way of the commission. Do you agree that that's good for no one? Thank you. Are there any additional questions for the petitioner? Seeing none, I'll uh, ask for a uh, motion to approve. Anyone? Please, please. Mm -hmm. They're please. begging. <laughs> Mr. Coleman, you turn on your microphone, please. Your microphone, I think. I'll make that motion to approve uh, the request. Uh, case um, 2009-005 with the conditions as recommended by staff. Do we have a second? Seconded by Commissioner Kemplin. Uh, Commissioner Coleman, would you like to speak to the motion? Well, I think this is a great project, and um, you know, I was happy to hear that the Planning and Zoning Commission um, recommended that the trail segment be included in the project. That's correct. So, is that part of your staff recommendation then, as well? No, it's not repeated again in this. Okay, well, I'd like to add that to my motion then, that the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation relating to that 255-foot segment of trail be included in this project. So within your motion, you're supporting P&Zs, or would you like to add that as an additional um, recommendation? Sorry. Uh, I guess I'd like to include that in my original motion, but we can if uh, with Mr. Kaplan's uh, consent. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Coleman, it may not be necessary to include it in the UDC Commission um, conditions because it's, it's already a condition in the Planning Zoning Commission, so they will have to follow it because the Planning Zoning Commission had made that a condition. Understand. Okay. Any further discussion? Just to clarify, I believe this is just with condition one and two then because three had been dropped. Has it been dropped or we're re rewording it? Would you like to make a friendly amendment to that effect, Commissioner Joyner? Or I was trying to remember what you said at the first. I didn't know if you changed that at that time. Well, I, um, Mr. Adams had suggested that we use the word proportionality, or, or we can just. I would drop it and just say we have specs already and not, not. That they're put in. obligated to follow. Yeah. Okay. But Will you accept that as a friendly amendment, Commissioner Coleman? Commissioner Kemplin? Um, accepted. Any further discussion? Um, I'd just like to make one comment on um, f following up on the, the gateway and the design element feature. It is a conceptual package, um, and the uh, the elements, I think, are um, well thought of, as you mentioned. The, the one thing I think that uh, the Northern Lights Center has a very distinct and very artistic um, element there, and I would be a little bit wary of, um, you know, playing in the same family but not, um, you know, drawing too closely upon that because it is such a truly artistic element. Um, but the inclusion of the lighting and those sorts of aspects are great for that corridor, I think. So thank you very much. Any further discussion? 
Any objections to passing the case? No objections. Case is passed. Moving on to 2009-023. Um, request for a sign variance for the Performing Arts Center um, staff. Yes, yes, Mr. Chair. The um, Alaska Center for the Performing Arts is requesting a sign variance to allow a lighter colored background with a darker contrasting color for the lights and symbols of a proposed sign. Nancy Harper with the PAC has brought a show and tell here for us tonight. It's a model of the sign that uh, the PAC is proposing so that the commissioners can get an idea of what that sign will look like. The request is a variance from 2147080A3A to allow a lighter colored background with a darker contrasting color for the letters and symbols for a proposed sign. The sign would be installed on the east facade of the building facing Town Square Park. The request is for an internally illuminated, uh, illuminated identifier sign that reads Alaska Center for the Performing Arts. The proportion, the Portions of the sign that do not meet the sign code are the word Alaska and the words for the performing arts. The sign also includes three dots. These elements do not meet the sign code because the code specifies that internally illuminated signs must be illuminated in either of two ways. And those two ways are, number one, it must be either an opaque background with transfers translucent letters and symbols, the sign does not meet this standard, or number two, a translucent darker colored background with a lighter contrasting color for the letters and symbols. The word center meets the standard, but the remaining words and dots do not. Thus, it is for this reason that a sign variance is requested. The Alaska Center for the Performing Arts has also included a digital marquee sign, which was included in your packet for which they will return to the UDC in approximately three years, uh, seeking approval for that sign. Also, over the next few years, the planning department will be updating the downtown land use code. And as part of that update, new regulations for signs will be formulated. There has been some discussion regarding the creation of an entertainment district. The PAC would be included in that district. The six sign variance standards are indicated in the report with the department's responses and staff can answer any questions about the variance request that the commission may have. Are there any questions for staff? Uh, is this um, a sign, uh, is the wording going to remain the same on this east wall? Uh, sign? Yes, it's, sh it's shown in the packet. Okay, so it's just the color that, the background color that changes. That's, that's correct. Okay. And the, 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 um, the request for a light background with the darker colors mm -hmm. for that word Alaska and, and the other words is indicated in the report. Mm -hmm. Sharon, it seems like a case where maybe technology is surpassed where, where our sign code once was. Uh, with this particular sign, I'd agree with you, but I think there are other signs in town that don't have this or won't have this degree of sophistication, where I think it's still appropriate to have those, um, that the sign code as it, as it is, reads right now. But in this case, you don't feel that's true? No, not at all. Thanks. Commissioner Joyner? As I was reading, I was trying to picture what was acceptable and what wasn't, what was the difference. And the ordinance was to preclude those signs that used to sit all along the road that were white and they would stick the letters on them? Right. Is that what we were getting away from? Yeah. It's, it's and, sort of like that, but not at all like that? Yes, and Commissioner Joyner, I, oftentimes when those signs on trailers were prohibited, they simply took the same sign and put it on a pole. Um, but what that um, section of the code is meant to prohibit is a lot of the, you know, the box signs that we see on poles that have a white background, that have fluorescent tubes in the back, and it you know, has darker lettering um, to identify the business. And, and that's what was, it was meant to preclude this. And this sign that's being presented to you all tonight is completely different from that type of sign. 
any other questions for staff? So we'll if we approve this variance for this sign, um, and we have other um, requests for installations of this similar type, um, you know, from other locations in the municipality, um, they would meet this, the conditions for a variance, or is this confined just to the downtown uh, area? To the chair, Mr. Kemplin, um, each of those signs as they come forward, if there is a variance request, they will be just on a case-by-case -case basis. We did look at this uh, particular sign in regard to the, to the fact that it's likely to be included in, in a future entertainment district. And the other one was is that this is a nonprofit um, facility. It's, it's not a commercial use. If we were to look at a um, sign downtown, but it was a commercial business, we would look at it differently than we would that's advertising um, events at a public facility. And so if the nonprofit, uh, the Providence Hospital or you know, the university you know, comes forward with you know, a, a request for different signage, you know, for their, um, to, to mark their facilities, uh, they could, this variant would, would be applicable? Through the Chair, Mr. Kemplin, the hospital is not a um, public facility. Um, as in terms of the, the university, as I said before, we view it on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any further questions for staff? Would the petitioner step forward? Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, staff, um, my name is Nancy Harbour, and I am the president at the Alaska Center for the Performing Arts. I lead the nonprofit service organization, which is under contract to the municipality of Anchorage to manage, book, and market the four venue Performing Arts Center in downtown. I'm here tonight with my colleagues, Karen. Larson of uh, Creative Space and Shannon Miller and Stephanie Buck of RSA Engineering to present for your consideration our exterior sign project. Over a year ago, the board of directors of the center began a strategic planning process to consider the future challenges of the facility as we approached our 20th anniversary season. One of the primary areas of concern was associated with making sure our community knew what the building was and what happened within it. As a reminder, the center was built in the 1980s as part of Project 80s, which brought many new and wonderful recreational and cultural facilities to the community. Unfortunately, the center's design and construction was challenging and resulted in serious cost overruns, which forced many items to be removed from the plan in order to save money. Exterior, exterior signage was eliminated as part of those efforts to save money. Also a part of protecting the long-term decisions associated with the exterior signage, a variance was approved in the late 1980s which required review and acceptance by the Urban Design Commission of any exterior signage affixed to the building. Over the last 20 years, solutions to this problem have been approached with a band-aid instead of a cure. Our solution has two steps. The first is to install an exterior sign that actually identifies the building. The second is to install a marquee-like digital sign that highlights the many activities that happen within the facility. We're here to talk to you tonight about the identifier sign. That's what we're calling it. With a board-approved sign plan, a committee was formed to tackle this challenge. We solicited design proposals from several professionals and upon review chose designer Karen Larson of Creative Space. Her design, which we're looking at a small model of, um, embraces the facility's unique aesthetic, is energy conscious, and highlights the artistic nature of what the facility is all about. This identifier sign will be, six, will be a six foot high by 40 foot seven inch long LED illuminated, illuminated sign box with Lexan face, partially covered with perforated blackout vinyl with the center LED backlit, dimensional letters with Alaska, which we'll 
uh, be routed um, and dimensional letters painted blue to match the fascia band that already exists around the building. Three dots followed by four of the performing arts. The background of the identifier sign will subtly change color with LED color wash as our model shows. The positioning of the sign will complement the vertical nature of the rings of lights, the star rings, which was uh, percent for our installation as part of the original construction, and the square windows that adorn the front of the building. The light from the sign will work in conjunction with the rings of lights and the illumination that comes from the glass facade facing Town Square Park. We've included several pictures of the building which show the placement of the sign on pages 12, 13, and 14 of your, the application packet. We are asking that the Commission approve this identifier sign. In order for that to happen, we know variance from AMC 2147-080-A3-A is required. This variance to code would allow the lighter colored background with a darker contrasting color for the lights and symbols. Our application goes into significant detail about our signage goals, objectives, and action plan. We've included detailed information relative to our variance requests, drawings, and LED specifications. We spent time talking with primary clients, our eight resident companies who do the lion's share of presenting and promoting within the building, as well as many of our downtown neighbors. We presented our plan to many groups and are pleased to have their letters of support incorporated in this application. We believe this identifier sign will be a very positive addition to the Alaska Center for the Performing Arts, not only to direct patrons and potential patrons to our door, but as a uniquely artful addition to the visual landscape of downtown. This sign would answer many issues addressed in the Anchorage Downtown Comprehensive plan, adding vibrancy to downtown while helping define the downtown core as a cultural center, accentuating the role that the Alaska Center for the Performing Arts plays in the community. Thank you very much for your consideration. Channing, um, Karen, and I are ready to answer any questions that commissioners might have. Are there any questions for the petitioner? Commissioner Kemplin. Hi. Hey. Uh, when you're going through the, the, the process of uh, developing the design you know, for this sign, did you get any feedback from uh, some of the um, uh, manufacturers uh, of signs uh, here in the community um, regarding you know, the, what you're proposing to do and um, you know, how it may uh, uh, impact their future you know, business or what they offer? Uh, to clients? Through the chair, um, Commissioner Kempton, yes, we did. In fact, um, this model was built by SignCo. Um, we met with Glacier Sign. We did talk with quite a few sign makers as we approached this whole process, for sure. When, um, uh, and, and because the identifier sign of our plan, we wanted to be fairly unique uh, to follow the aesthetic of the building. Um, to be able to bring what we sort of characterize as an artful design to this commission that cares about that. Um, we were really conscientious about making sure that the design, and, and it was part of Karen's uh, uh, design, to make sure that it fit within the actual design of the Performing Arts Center as well. So you'll see it, it is designed to sort of fit within the windows in what was a very large blank space uh, facing the east side, um, where I presume, although I don't know this for sure, uh, the original signage uh, was supposed to go. Mm -hmm. So yes, we did do that research. Commissioner Coleman. Uh, I like your sign, uh, but I just wanted to comment on your future sign, the marquee. Yes, sir. And I'm wondering if it's being designed to uh, attract the aircraft flying over from Merrill Field. And, I, and if the sign could be brought down, I think to, it, might, it might be something to consider. Is that uh, putting it up high like that? And I think one of your comments in your narrative was that the a consultant to you walked right by the place without seeing it. Okay. It was somewhere in this packet of information that 
uh, somebody was in town, walked right by your your center, and I, and I can understand that. But I think putting the marquee up where you're proposing it isn't going to relate to pedestrians. Doesn't even relate to people driving by in cars. In fact, it might be kind of distracting up there. Um, so just a suggestion, something to consider. I know the lower facade is very busy. It's a very inviting blank space up there. But really try and make it relate to the street, you know, to the sidewalk and the street rather um, than putting it up high. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Coleman, I appreciate your comments. Um, one of the reasons why we have uh, broken this plan into two sort of uh, distinctly different uh, categories is uh, to make sure that we're looking at those kinds of things. Um, honestly, about 12 years ago, I came to the Commission with what I um, consider to be a pedestrian signage plan, which was not approved. Uh, the challenge with the Performing Arts Center is that it's such a huge structure and there are people coming from so many different angles. It's almost impossible to answer the, the drive-by with uh, and lay that with the pedestrian. Uh, one of the original components of the building uh, was exterior kiosks that could answer the pedestrian issues. And in fact, there was power originally stubbed off and you know, covered over um, when money was run out. Unfortunately, over 20 years, all of that power has been degraded and removed now, thankfully, um, as a result of the um, heated sidewalk process that was put in as part of the connectivity between the two convention centers. And we, we really feel a part of that. We um, are a partner with the two convention centers. So I do think kiosking was a really good idea 20 years ago when the building was designed. Um, one of the allowances uh, when the original variance was put in place allowed the banners which hang on the east side of the building between the columns right below where this sign will be uh, installed if, if approved. The challenge with those banners now is that the gorgeous trees that were planted 20 years ago on Town Square Park completely block them from being able to be seen as you either walk or drive down Fifth Avenue on the sidewalks there. So, you know, time changes all of those uh, those things that we look at and um, the, the digital marquee we want to make sure uh, is right for the community, is right. It, it's certain, one of our challenges is trying to tell people what was going on inside the Performing Arts Center and there is so much. Just in the last two weeks we have 35 different booked events and it's very hard for people who don't even know that that's the building to tell them what goes on. And it's very important to us that that message is done in a high quality fashion, is married with the identifier, is um, affordable, and the technology is something that, that will last. And we sort of found ourselves, as we came to present this to you all this evening, not sure about that second part. So that's why we have put it off. We don't think it would be a good message to send to build uh, or install a digital marquee that costs $200,000 in the current economic climate. But thank you for your comments because those are ones we have thought about a lot. Commissioner Gassick. Um, I, well, first of all, I just want to echo Commissioner Coleman's concerns about the digital marquee. So really take that into careful consideration in the future of placement and size and how it fits in with the rest of the architecture of the building. But overall, I, I was just really happy to see that the architecture of the building was truly considered and helped inform the decision to place the sign where it was placed. Because you truly have a landmark building in downtown Anchorage. So it deserves a sign. Thank you. Commissioner Joyner. Um, I just had a couple questions. Is, it, is the sign just on the east side? I was looking at you. Yes. And are these colors, the, are they the same, they're the same as the rings? 
the, the rooms are um, just regular light bulbs that have been painted. And our goal, of course, eventually is to um, have those lights be LED as well for obvious reasons. Um, the spectrum that is allowed with LED is, it goes forever. Um, the lights on the rooms are very specific, they're yellow, blue, I think they're primary colors, and a pink. So um, yes and no, all of those colors could be repeated uh, through the LED computerized um, coloring, but um, we probably will want to be more expansive than just the room lights. It said coordinated with them, so I was trying to picture like like they're blinking and they're one color, and then this is changing and it's another color. How that's coordinated or just looking but, like like they're not coordinated. I, I think coordinated um, is not meant to mean synchronized or in any fashion to match the pattern. The staller rings, um, which as I said earlier, was part of the Percent for Art um, installation at construction, is completely computerized uh, and with a very particular set of patterns. There are six different patterns that go, if you, if you were to sit in Town Square Park um, on a wintry night and sit long enough, you could see six different very distinct patterns that those lights uh, would produce. Um, it would be virtually impossible to match them and probably would make us all crazy. Um, all we want to try to do is have subtle. And what you see here is a timing. This, we could actually blink this if we wanted to, as you can imagine, which of course we don't want to do. We just want to have a sense of theatrics, frankly. Um, so coordinated has more to do with not being um, uh, how do I put this uh, negatively impactful of the star rings. Okay, I can tell I didn't answer your question okay. very well. Yeah, I and see, I, I've watched the rings probably from humpies go through six stages, but. Um, mm -hmm. I was going to picture this, this with that. Um, and just because it's a variance, and we have to take those really seriously, because now we have new technology. And once you pass a variance, I mean, maybe you won't be unique next year, because maybe we're going to have 15 of these say, oh, we want one like that now. I mean, did, what was the thought process for we can't do what the ordinance says, but, we're, but we want to do something that like you said, it's not what we're trying to preclude in the ordinance, but you see what I mean? Once we say, okay, we have a new technology and so we can get a variance and do this, I don't want to see us move into things we don't want, but we've set a precedent for because we did one that was maybe nicer than what we're going to see next time. Teacher, I, it's hard for me to answer that question, Mr. Edward. When we were thinking about this design, it was because we felt it was the most aesthetically perfect for this area on, on the actual Alaska Center for the Performing Arts. I, you know, we didn't think about anybody else's. The challenge that, that, that the way, the way this uh, sign is designed, we couldn't accomplish what this sign does uh, if we stayed strictly in that code. So that's frankly how we approached it. We loved the design, we loved the aesthetic that matched the building, and then we set about communicating with staff to figure out if it was possible, and if so, how the drama of the sign and the variances could work together to be accomplished. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess I would uh, reinforce that the, as per the staff recommendations this meeting, all six um, of the, uh, the variance requirements, it's a, qual or sorry, it's a quantitative basis on which to look at this. Um, and then that does not involve the qualitative aspect of uh, whether the sign is nice or not. So if it does meet the various requirement, the variance requirements, then it's similar to the other landscape elements we view on a normal basis where we can offer recommendations and ideas. 
Um, so I think for future, um, and it goes with uh, Commissioner Kemplin's comment, for future ones that may came in, come in front of us, they still need to be judged by the six quantitative variance um, aspects, um, which might be harder if they're not profit or not 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 for profit or the such. So I think there's some protection that this doesn't necessarily hold our hands for future uh, people that come in front of us with more devious uh, sign ideas. Commissioner <laughs> um, Anya. Yeah, I, um, I have to comment on one. I think your sign is looks interesting and fits with, within the agricultural vocabulary of the building. Maybe it's shorter would be a you know, better proportion, but it's still a nice sign. On the other hand, I must echo the comments of my other fellow commissioners. The Marquis, I, the other sign, I don't think really fits quite well in as of the size. And in my opinion, it's going to be very difficult to read and to see from when you are driving a car. So I must congratulate for the first one. But for the second one, I really have my doubts. And that would be in front of us in the future for a variance as well. We're only ruling on the, um, the first sign. So we'll have a chance to see it again. Okay. Um, are there any other uh, questions? Seeing no other questions, and entertain a motion to approve. Moved by Commissioner Kimmer, seconded by Commissioner Gassick. Um, would you speak to the motion, Mr. Kimmer? Yes, thanks. I move to approve case 2009-023 to allow a sign variance for a single permanent identifier sign for the Alaska Center for Performing Arts. Uh, I think the, uh, the package and staff report demonstrates that the six variant standards have been substantially met. I think the design is great. Uh, I thank the uh, petitioner for the complete package. It really gives us a, a concise look at, at what it will be like. Uh, I would like to add to my comments that I would like to see the digital marquee uh, placement and size considered uh, more when that comes back before us. Thanks. Any other comments? Commissioner Kemplin? Yeah, I'd just like to comment that uh, you know, I struggle with these sign variances because they can be kind of controversial uh, you know, when we get them. And we have heard, the Commission has heard from uh, you know, petitioners uh, for these sign variances that um, you know, they perceive that there's a double standard between you know, the public sector and the private sector. Uh, and I'm a little sensitive to you know, that charge. Uh, and so um, I'm a little cautious about um, you know, this proposal for you know, variance you know, from the sign code. But um, as I've been kind of working my mind around it and kind of thinking about it, I, I, um, I guess I will um, uh, you have to agree that uh, you know, the conditions have been met and that you know, the, uh, the sign does, and the approach that the, has been taken, you know, does um, you know, blend in pretty well with the, uh, the character uh, of the building and its use, and it's kind of a unique you know, type of, uh, of, of situation. So, but I just want to put on the record that you know, my, my, I do have a little bit of concern about what we're setting ourselves up for you know, in the future, but do appreciate the, uh, you know, the effort of the Performing Arts Center and all the advocates for you know, um, uh, improving uh, the visibility of the building you know, into the general community. I think that the design that they've come forward uh, you know, does, um, uh, does work. So thanks. I'll just have to echo a couple of comments as well. I think the sign is uh, very well designed, and even though the building is very large, there aren't necessarily many logical places to place a sign on the front. So the sign kind of seems to fit where it should be. Um, from a visibility point of view, from pedestrians or vehicles, it seems like there might be some challenges on Fifth um, with the trees that are in front of it. A few of the visual simulations you provide in the package, um, the trees cover center, but you can still be, see performing arts. Um, and as a uh, you know a continually growing city. Probably one of the more interesting aspects is that uh, from adjacent buildings, whether the Hilton or um, other locations, the sign might be visible for the people that are here as tourists. So um, it being a, a colorfully illuminated sign adds um, you know, an elevation element to how pedestrians might, uh, might look at it as well. Um, so thank you very much for bringing it in front of us. Oh, there is one, Commissioner Joyner. Um, I'm going to support the variance, but 
just to reiterate that the um, meeting the conditions is somewhat subjective because we've had people come before us, you know, and say, with the same argument that this is the only thing we can do and it fits with our building. And, and I know that's for us to decide, but it is somewhat subjective. It's not just as clear cut as uh, it meets the conditions or not. And with things changing, I can see other other people coming with signs that they feel do meet the conditions in the same way and would argue just as logically as the Performing Arts Center and they and they don't probably and it just makes it a little more difficult to turn some down and accept others um, based on those when when it is subjective so but we do need a sign and I work a few blocks from the building I go there all the time for performances and have people had asked me where where it is and say it's a great big building that looks like a performing arts center but it does need a sign it does the first time I noticed though it doesn't have a sign so you do have to know that any other comments are there any objections to passing this motion seeing no objections the motion is passed moving on to EDC case number 2009 031 um, site and landscape plan review for University of Alaska's new facility. No title on it. Health Sciences Building, mm -hmm. Phase One. A staff um, report. Yes, the uh, case is before the commission tonight. It's uh, for the University of Alaska at Anchorage. It's for concept site and landscape plan review for the Health Sciences Building, Phase 1. The Health Sciences Building is the first building slated for construction in the Health Sciences District that is uh, under development. Staff reviewed the design guidelines that are found in the UMED plan to determine compliance with uh, those design guidelines. In most cases, the building design and site development and circulation meet the guidelines. Staff has provided conditions for the final review of the, of the project. Staff added a photo of a vertical bike rack, which was courtesy of Commissioner Coleman that the uh, design consultants consider using that in lieu of the typical bike rack. And the reasons for that are spelled out in the staff's um, staff report. Staff spoke with Lori Stanky, the non-motorized transportation coordinator, about providing um, a trail connection from Chester Creek Trail to the building. Ms. Genke recommended a connection from the proposed trail to the building. Otherwise, she foresees that users traveling from the south on the trail will cut across the site to get to the building rather than continue to the corner and then travel back south on the walkway. The Trusted Creek Trail is scheduled for construction this summer. Also included in the packet was um, the bicycle, sorry, the pedestrian bicycle and ski circulation plan that is taken from the University of Alaska Anchorage facilities master plan. And that does show a connection from Ch the Chester Creek Trail to the buildings east side and along the south side. The project does respond to Northern City design. In terms of the building design, they have uh, used in metal light shells, will, which will reflect sunlight deeper into the interior of the building. Also, in the exterior of the building, uh, canopies are being provided over the building entrances, and there will be heated pavement that will extend from the primary entrance door as a pathway. They're not going to heat that whole plaza. Um, and it'll go to the drop-off lane and extend over to the accessible parking sidewalk. There are two fire lanes shown on the site plan, one in the northeast uh, corner of the property, and that one uh, has now been changed from a gravel surface to a geogrid surface. 
The second fire lane is shown with an asphalt surface. It's to the south of the building. The fire lane, together with the service access to the dumpster, represents a very large expanse of asphalt. There's a 50-50 chance that this area will be replaced in three years when phase two begins construction. Otherwise, under the university funding cycle, it would not be constructed for at least five years. Under this scenario, a geo-grid installation or similar is recommended. In any case, construction of phase two will necessitate the removal of most of the parking lot, asphalt, the concrete, and landscaping to accommodate accommodate the new building and garage and the fire lane will be relocated at that time. That's all I have. Any questions for staff? With the Changes to the plans you just noted, Sharon. Are there any um, changes that you uh, want to have for the ten recommendations that you have in the document, um, particular number two, which does say the geo grid, geo grid shall be installed? Is that redundant now? No, I was talking about the, the geo grid on the south side of the building. Oh, I'm sorry. Which is currently asphalt. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Sure. Any other questions for staff? Petitioner. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Terry Schoenthal. I'm tonight with uh, representing Land Design North uh, under contract with uh, Livingston Sloan Associates uh, to the University of Alaska for design of the Health Sciences Building. Uh, also with us tonight are, is John Hansen, who's the project manager from the university, and Mike Smith, the director of facilities, if uh, there are other questions that they might be better uh, equipped to, to answer. Uh, what I'd like to open with really briefly tonight is that um, when this project first started up, the, the, the major effort actually was on master plan. Uh, it should be noted that the UAA master plan uh, did not address the side of Providence Drive because, in fact, UAA didn't own this property at the time. So what they've been looking toward is to actually update that master plan. And uh, Livingston Sloan and A. St. Gross, another firm from Lower 48 who specializes in master planning of uh, campuses, along with uh, the rest of our team, worked pretty carefully at the beginning of this project to take a look at not just uh, what would happen with this particular building, and, and this represents that property right there, that acquired property on that side of Providence Drive, but what would future development occur in there? How can we place this building so that it, does, it not only doesn't impede future development, but that it leads to a unified whole? And one of the things that Ayers St. Grace did in this uh, project was they did a, an assessment of a number of universities around the United States, uh, taking a look at what made for great common spaces in, in well-known universities, the University of Virginia and, and the University of Washington and others that had really terrific common spaces. And it had to do with the size and the scale of those spaces, uh, not just with the space itself, but what happens around the perimeter, a sense of enclosure to that. So right now, UAA is a very linear campus. Uh, I mean, it's really, if there's one thing that probably is the unifying element, it's the spine, and that's an interior aspect of that. Now, as the campus extends across Providence Drive, what can we do to, to use this as a real opportunity to create some really special space for that? And so this area right here becomes a giant commons. It, it's bisected by Providence Drive, but visually it works from both ends. Uh, on the, the uh, north side right now, that's a parking lot, but it would, that parking lot would go away. It would become bounded by buildings on either side. And uh, it would incorporate, because the pedestrian crossing in Providence Drive is, is tricky. I mean, it happens that all the time, but it's dicey uh, to go out and watch these students go across where visibility is poor. Uh, it incorporates uh, uh, two, over, uh, two crossings across Providence Drive that link, actually link the buildings and help reinforce that, uh, that great common space. 
So with that in mind, as you can see, this is our phase one health sciences, right here, relatively small building in the overall concept. But what you can see is that on the uh, south side of that building, that it will be connected with a future phase, and in fact that, that will be the next major phase of the work on that side. And uh, so whatever happens on that side has to be considered to be something in temporary construction. Um, that said, the design of the health sciences building then, um, upside down, Include, incorporates new parking that's on the south side of the building. It has a great south aspect at this point. And then it has views across Providence Drive toward the rest of the university on the north side. There are pathways leading down to the walkways that are on Providence Drive. Um, it was noted, and, and the UAA considers it highly desirable, to have a connection from here to the Chester Creek Trail that, that would be newly constructed. However, the one issue with that is that the university doesn't control the property that that would uh, occur on. That belongs to Providence Medical Center. Um, I think the university would be amenable to speaking with them to try to coordinate and see what can be done to make that happen. There are some great issues with it, but I, again, it, it, it's not on the plans now because we don't control the property that that would have to be on. Um, additionally, uh, the space that was identified uh, that was pointed out for GeoGrid is that area right there. And uh, right now it's partly asphaltic, but asphalt paving and part concrete paving. The intent to be to create a large plaza there. And the design team has been working with uh, the fire department and with the, with the, the university maintenance department and others to come up with a solution. And, and I think that without specifying a specific product, which I think that this does require, a GeoGrid is an actual product, I think that uh, looking at similar products would be certainly an acceptable alternative to what we're showing right now, and we wouldn't have an issue with that. Um, there are a couple of other things. One of the conditions that's noted is that we should consider on the north side where there's deciduous trees, replacing them with uh, um, evergreen trees. And we would like to strike that if we can. And the reason for it is, is there's a couple good reasons for striking that. One is that we don't want to, the, the reason being for those would be that they create a windbreak from the north wind. But the fact is, is that you need a lot of evergreen trees. You need a real good buffer to actually accomplish that. And if you accomplish that kind of a buffer, then you've reduced site visibility and increased security issues that are common on campuses. You don't want to create areas where there isn't good visibility, where people can't see what's going on there. So that's one of the aspects. The other is that I would also ask you to, to consider that during the, a good portion of the year, the sun actually rises in the north and sets in the north. And that uh, a lot of the internal light of this actually will come from the north side of the building. So uh, replacing that with uh, evergreen trees on that side of the building would have some impact on the ability to get light into the, into the building. Um, with that, I guess I would like to open it up to any questions you may have. Questions for the petitioner? Commissioner Kemblin? Yes. Um, pedestrians and access uh, uh, to this building. You know, I, I kind of look at the, um, you know, the siding of the building and um, you know, the parking over right across the street over at the student center uh, and I see a lot of jaywalking. I see a lot of uh, mid block um, uh, crossings from students, um, you know, coming from the student center uh, over, over from the parking uh, a lot, uh, over to this building, uh, and you know, on the curve. And I'm just wondering, 
Uh, have you thought about that, um, the flow, pedestrian flows, and, you know, because um, I've seen it happen, you know, more than once where, you know, we put in a nice site, but we don't take into account, you know, the natural behavior of people for a direct path. Uh, and I see a direct path being, you know, you know, right across the curve to the main entrance. So could you explain how your thought process has addressed that? Well, the design team has met with traffic on a number, on a number of occasions. And in fact, this project has spawned a new project that the municipality is undertaking uh, just to address exactly what you're talking about. One of the issues is that how do you control pedestrian crossing? Well, in this particular area, the, the median of uh, in that location makes it difficult for a good part of the year, not all year, but for a good part of the year to actually make that crossing. But more importantly, Spirit Way, which is this intersection, I believe, right here, um, renamed recently, is, uh, is becoming signalized. The design is underway right now to, to catch up with this project to create a signalized intersection that links directly across to and that is a direct access to the student center, to the parking lots on the other side. So there will be uh, signalized access or crossing at that location for a couple of reasons. One is that the, this coming summer, if I'm not mistaken, the new trail will be completed, which comes down, which then creates a great link from student housing to the West Campus, which is likely to be used pretty heavily. And you have this, uh, the new health sciences building uh, on this side, the student parking on the other side. And uh, so that, signal, that signalized intersection is really a vital piece to this puzzle. And when is that going to occur? Um, it's in the design stages right now. It's intended, I believe, for construction this summer. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Anya? I must follow up on Mr. Captain's comments. It seems to be that according to your parking layout and the entrance of the building, most of the people are going to come through the west entrance to the building. To this entrance? Yeah, project. basically. Uh, but on the other hand, it seems to be that the, the left entrance seems to be the main entrance to the building. Is this correct or not? Well, the main entrance to the building is right here. Yeah. There is an entrance down here, however. That's at a different level, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? My name is Paul Doherty. I'm with Livingston Sloan Architects. For the, I'm the project manager for the project. The, the entry that comes into the building off of the west side is intended to be the primary entrance. Okay. The shuttle drop-off that's been laid out uh, for transportation back and forth around campus and the locations of the sidewalks are intended to put that as a primary access. There is a door over here now for exiting purposes and, and for other other issues, but with the phase two facility added, the intention is is this the phase two facility is added and that same area retains its its main entry feature. Um, although the parking garage will probably be the primary location that, that people will be coming to the building from. And if I could relate back to another question that was asked before. One of the, the issues that we had discussed uh, at great length with the UAA uh, team uh, was their concern about students bolting back and forth across the street, and that's a serious issue for them. These sidewalks are not necessarily maintained beyond the bus stop or the bus drop off down here in the winter. And so what we looked at was there's a there's a grade difference here, and as we build our we have to build our grade up to get our building at a at a point that works for this parking lot. And what that afforded us was the opportunity to put a landscape wall along here, not a, it's, and it's more the, uh, what do they call it, the landscape block like type Allen wall. Block with right, landscape. like Allen block type wall. And the idea being that as you come out of here, that, that this wall is set at a height that can be a sitting height, but it's not, it's, the other side of it is, is six to eight feet down. So you don't come out of this door on the north side and bolt right across the street without first hurting yourself going over the edge of that wall. And that was, that was done to try and force pedestrian traffic to use these lanes. And we purposely pulled these pedestrian lanes as far away from the street as we could to 
sort of make them more more enjoyable to use and to keep them and we've set them wide enough so that this, the the uh, university's plows can get down them to keep them free in the winter. My other question is related as to the entrance. It seems to me that um, the ADA parking and the regular traffic will be going going east against the building and then come along the building to the main door. Like you, for the regular wheelchair person, I think it will come right but against the building. I think ADA, ADA parking is right yeah. here and that the door is right here. Yeah, but my, yeah, my, my question is, have you thought about pushing, where are you going to locate the push button for the X, for the opening of the door? Because what I'm saying, it seems to me that the, the wheelchair will come straight against the building and then go south to the main door and the door open against. If I look to your, to your fourth plan, My question is... Yeah, there's, yeah. there's an actuator for the door, yes. Okay. Where is it located? Can you move on? Is, I, at, the, at this design stage, I don't know exactly where that actuator is located. Okay. What is the dimension between the doors and the landscape? I'm looking at your drawing L102, more or less. That will be 10 feet distance between the door and the landscape or more? Out yeah. Here? Well, at least, and 30 feet. How, at least. At least 10 feet. Yeah. Okay, that would be enough. My concern is if the wheelchair comes like an L shape to the main building, because I, th I don't think the wheelchair is going to go back. That, yeah, I think the wheelchair will come straight along, no, no back, right north. There. Further north, right at the end, yes. You will go right, you will get into the sidewalk at the end of the ADA and go right to the right against the building. Well, the, the door is That's where the door is. The yeah, door but, is right but, here. yeah, but the wheelchair will come like an L shape. Yeah, go well, there. The, wheel, yeah, the, wheelchair, yeah. the wheelchairs can come. I don't, I don't think you will go that way. Yeah. This way. That, that way, yeah, the second way, yeah. That's what I'm saying. You're going to. They're going to have an L shape. If the door opens and there's no is not clean properly, they are going to have a hard time making the L shape traffic. I don't think they will go back to the main to the main core. I think it will go straight against the building. If you if you yeah, come around here, yeah. it's that's the way it will go. That was saying. I think that's the, the way they are going to go for them to the building, so. But there's plenty of room between yeah, that landscape island and space out there. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of room. If you look at the, the door, the door is three feet, so there's, there's probably maybe 15 feet across there, if not more. Okay, okay. Let's have a close, a close look to it. Any other questions for the petitioner? Um, I have a few. Um, on the plans in the survey, it shows a, what appears to be a significant amount of existing vegetation um, and uh, sort of revised uh, or revised vegetation lines for what will exist aren't shown on the plans. Is there going to be where possible within limits of grading to retain as much of that it, it, existing vegetation as possible? And that is the intent. Uh, one of the comments from staff is, uh, in fact, uh, to utilize chain link fencing with uh, with the block, single block versus some other means of, of actually protecting that. And that is uh, an acceptable, uh, well, it's a little more expensive, but it's certainly acceptable. And, and uh, every effort's going to be made to preserve what we can of the native vegetation in that location. And uh, limits of uh, retention will be shown in the next step that we see. I That's assume. correct. OK. Um, and just as a comment, you typically show that, but it's missing on this one. Um, for the cover, for the bike rack, it shows a detail for a ribbon rack, uh, but it looks like there might be a covered structure over top of it. It is, it is intended that there be a covered structure, and, and we appreciate the suggestion of the bike rack that was included. Let's take a look. One thing the university is doing right now is taking a comprehensive look at their bike, at their university bike plan, and that includes taking a look at how they store bikes and, and 
So while it would be easy for me to say, yes, we'll comply with that right now, I, I would like to defer to the maintenance people who are taking a look at a more comprehensive approach of which unit to select for the rest of the campus, so. Agreed. And um, I can't, I remember seeing that, but which, was there a comment for that? It was just the staff, was it in the recommendation? It was just included, I think, as a recommendation. I don't think there was a specific comment. Okay. Um, the wall on the north side of the building you just referred to, I'm assuming that's a landscape detail that shows a sign on the front of that wall? Yes, it will. Um, and in one of the sections it shows the footing for why it might be a railing along the top of it. I'm assuming for the height that a railing, a that, safety guard rail. most provided. likely the case. We don't know what the exact height of that is okay. yet, but, but that's probably true. And then um, a, a last comment, which might be s stretching our um, input on things, but the the landscape in front of the building is very generous and it does direct people from the parking lot to kind of in an angular fashion towards the front but when you enter the building um, as per sheet a 101 it appears to have a fairly um, constrained uh, rectangular lobby space in the center of that um, for a university facility for this type of facility is it important to have good security a smaller space or is it possible to have a, a little bit more of a generous lobby well, I think I think budget's probably going to speak to that. Budget is the controlling controlling form in that. Actually, what what you see here is phase one and phase two is what was initially programmed as this building. Yes. <laughs> and as we did the budget analysis on it, um, it was more important to I mean the student life spaces are critical to university buildings and, and a large commons area had been in the plans and it's this actually space right here a two story enclosed space. It was delete classrooms or retain the common space and the functions of the education needs for the nursing program dictated that we retain the classrooms in this phase. Uh, it was not an easy decision for any, any of the folks on the team to make to defer that to phase two. And it does create that central space in there is, is fairly tight. I will tell you that, um, and this will be a surprise to my clients, that <laughs> Recently in the design, as we were looking at the main staircase that's up in this corner that goes up, we decided that we had designed it too narrow for its real function and to make it wide enough to get it up to a six foot wide stair, we actually had to spread that into the building out a little bit. So it has increased that lobby space by three or four feet in width down through there and made a much nicer area in there on both the first and the second floor. Okay. Spaces, so. and, and as the design develops, it would be great to see any opportunities to, whether it's materials, colors, or other ways to try and make the inside and the outside, you know, work well together. But this is conceptual, so. And thank you for your comments, saying you're moving towards that. Um, any other comments or uh, any other questions for petitioners? Sure. Yes, I just wanted to get further clarification on, Terry, what you are saying earlier about, um, my comment about wanting to connect uh, from Chester Creek Trail to the building. Did I understand you to say that the university doesn't own this parcel and that the Providence Hospital does? I thought there's been a land swap and UAA now owns this parcel. The, the, the property line is... Uh, shows up, I can yeah, this is This is the property line. It's dark line along here and the property on this side is Providence's property. So if this isn't really a dedicated street as my understanding that's still Providence's property even though it's got a name of Providence West Drive or whatever. And the trail itself is actually coming along on Providence as it crosses here. It's still on the Providence side. It, it has been a desire from the beginning from the design team's point of view because this is coming from housing and it's something that the students like to use to look at trying to bring an access up through here, a pedestrian access up through here. And we're still we're still looking at it. And and I'm confident that we can have it have it happen. And there's been a great deal of cooperation with the Providence folks. After all, this is a nursing education facility. So it's something that that they have a, a symbiotic relationship with. And, and uh, it, it is a desire to have that happen, and hopefully we'll see that in the next stage as we move through. 
one, one, if I could just jump in one moment though too on that, is that if you take a look right here where the trail, where the Chester Creek Trail comes across and comes out, there's a pretty, uh, it's a really steep grade to go up to that side. It may be that we could do something that would have stairs or something that goes up there, but we then run into the issue of ADA accessibility to do that. And, and the way, the way that to get past that, of course, would be to bring some form of access much further down this way into the site. And right now, that's a really tricky thing to do. So everyone agrees that would be a great thing to do. It's just proven to be a thorny issue to this point. For the staff recommendations that are in front of us, um, do you wish to comment or take exception to any of them or offer alternative wording? Um, there's only one that I would, I would suggest uh, that maybe there's some consideration given to. And, and I think we may end up having to change Title 21 to make that happen. But I think we have a very unfortunate situation if we can't even use our white spruce here in town in our landscape plans. It's been that way for a long time. but. For, to, if our own native spruce can't meet the requirements of Title 21 when it's the most hardy tree that we've got and, and it's native, then maybe there's something wrong. But um, we've been required, we, we, one of the staff comments is that we should use the, the uh, Black Hills version or the Black Hills white spruce and we can do that uh, to meet this. But I, I would hope that as you start taking a look at varying things in Title 21, perhaps that that's something worth coming up. Uh, again, we were also, I, we had to identify, the, the issue identified with the birches of having those small crowns. And we acknowledge that that is an issue here in town. We believe that's an enforcement issue and, and not one of specification. So um, recommendation A to the only, is the only one that you take exception to with the existing wording? Um, the one that we really take exception to is no. It, um, number nine, and I mentioned it earlier, if, we could, if you would give us some relief from number nine, and that's because we would prefer not to swap out the deciduous trees for evergreen trees on that north side. And then from the discussion that you just had for um, for recommendation number four, rather than um, being told to provide a walk rate connection to the east, it sounds like it might be fair just to change that to consider. Uh, sorry. Terrible. If we could do if we could change it to consider, that would be great. <laughs> oh, you can answer it. Don't worry. So anyway, yes, if, if, uh, if that could be changed to uh, consider, that would certainly be worthwhile to us. We're, we certainly will consider that. I can assure you that. Any other questions? Sharon? Mr. Chairman, Commission, Commissioners, um, regarding number four, I would prefer to see some effort of I mean, you know, working with uh, PAMC, you know, Providence Hospital, as well as uh, Lori Skanky, the non-motorized transportation coordinator, to have them see if there is some, uh, if that can be worked out or what the obstacles are. Because if, if it's not built at this phase, it, it may never um, be constructed. And it is shown on, you know, the um, ULA's own master plan as a exist as a uh, proposed pedestrian route so it's recognized that it is needed but um, I would like to see greater effort rather than just um, phrase it as consider something along the lines with uh, work with PA, PAMC and MOA non-motorized transportation coordinator to provide a walkway connection blah 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 from the proposed Chester Creek Trail as on as it reads as it reads thank you for the clarification if there are no other questions for the petitioner and entertain a um, motion a motion to approve this case anyone commissioner joiner if you want to hit it on the computer for the official officialness. Oh. No, oh, there you go. Um, I move for approval of case uh, 
31 concept site and landscape plan review for the University of Alaska Anchorage Health Sciences building with conditions uh, 1, 2, 3, well, as written, 5, 6, 7, striking 8 and 9, 10, and for 4 to read, um, pursue a walkway connection in cooperation with the, uh, did you already write this, the non-motorized transportation coordinator in Providence Hospital to the east side of service access lane or parking lot to Chester Creek? And maybe instead of shall, it'll say pursue resolution of the uh, trail issue. Um, I agree with the petitioner that, as we discussed earlier, if the trees meet mass and specifications, any white spruce can meet them. It doesn't have to be a black hill spruce. Um, although they, they're just a cultivar that have a nicer shape. I um, think that the um, petitioners get done a good job of starting a new part of the campus that will be important. And I like the whole concept of making it more of a, a campus that people recognize as a college campus with more of that feel. And, development a little more, even though I hate seeing the natural trees disappear at such a rate, but that's what happens. Um, did we have another condition? That was it. I think that represented what I heard from the discussion. Um, then the motion has been seconded, seconded by uh, Commissioner Coleman. Does anybody else wish to uh, make comment? Um, I'd just like to say that um, points Point number eight is a good one uh, for the discussion elsewhere this evening. I think as UDC, one of the things that uh, we should be commenting on are things like this. And uh, there have been a few meetings in the past year regarding trying to foster um, Alaskan businesses for development of nurseries and growing our local species up here um, so that we, have, um, we don't have to import our species from outside um, and also to... Um, give us a little bit better guarantee of the quality of the material that we get locally. Um, so I think that uh, encouraging better enforcement uh, within the municipality of the specifications that are already in existence um, is what we need to do rather than um, um, rely upon trying again with uh, different specifications. So I support what the, uh, the petitioner said in regards to that um, and thank you for a good project. Thank you. Um, are there any objections to the motion on the floor? Seeing no objections, motion passed. Sharon, do you have any um, additional information or reports for us? Um, just briefly, I wanted to bring up there is that letter in your packet from Erica McConnell. She tried to capture uh, some of the comments that the commissioners had regarding the Title 21 rewrite for the single family, two family, and townhouse residential design standards. Did she have any communication with you all about what you were supposed to do with this or what her expectations were? Or I haven't seen anything, and James may have. Um, I think my only concern with this is it does speak to very much to um, the specifics in here um, in one of the generalities, but I know that uh, at least in one of the emails that I had sent, it dealt with the larger, um, the larger relationships of this, um, you know, summarizing a bit of what uh, Commissioner Coleman and Commissioner Kemplin said in regard to um, pedestrian connections, uh, you know, some northern design aspects, and those larger kind of philosophies are intense. I don't think really made it into this very effectively, um, but that's just my personal opinion. I don't I'll ask the commissioners whether they share that uh, that take on it. Did she get that email? I don't know if it was ever forwarded. <laughs> I think I think that um, it, because it was Tom and herself that were on the CC list for that, so I think that she may have, but. Well, 
uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just like to point out that um, in the Sunday's paper, there was a, an insert in the Daily News, uh, Envision uh, Anchorage, and it's produced by you know, Providence Health and Services uh, Alaska and United Way. Uh, and you know, one of the um, you know, key components of it is uh, they have three uh, main things, or four, really, that they're kind of uh, emphasizing. Uh, economy, education, health, public safety, and social environment. Uh, and um, underneath the health is um, what they're trying to do is, you know, measure uh, quantitatively how things are changing uh, over time uh, in Anchorage. And um, I, I guess the, the, how it relates to this uh, is you know, the pedestrian experience. And uh, because when you look at the... Um, this category for obesity um, that they highlighted in uh, the publication and about how um, you know, it's certainly becoming uh, how uh, Anchorage is, exceeds the national average uh, in terms of uh, both uh, overweight uh, citizens and obese um, uh, citizens and uh, you know, when we're a, a, a winter city uh, we're in northern environment, six months of the year, you know, it's winter time, and, and you know, we're, as we develop our urban form and, and um, you know, lay out our, our residential structures for people, how they are able to get out and walk and, and ex get exercise, um, the more that we can make it conducive to a pedestrian-friendly environment, uh, the more likely it is that you know, we'll reduce these uh, rates of obesity and overweight uh, conditions uh, that have significant health costs uh, in, uh, to um, you know, organizations uh, here in the community. And, and I just wanted to kind of, again, this kind of gets back to you know, the, the larger comment uh, that was raised by the, at least raised by me, you know, as we were looking at the Title you know, 21 for these standards, that um, you know, they tend to, to emphasize still a preference for the automobile, you know, at the expense of uh, the pedestrian environment, uh, and that there are ways to have a more pedestrian-friendly environment, particularly as it relates to the garage. Uh, and um, I don't see where you know that's really kind of you know reflected in the comment letter. Although I do greatly appreciate you know staff's uh, production you know of this, but um, I think uh, this is the first time I saw it you know as it came before in the packet and. I guess I'd like to be able to have some opportunity for the, for the commission to talk a little bit about it, maybe when the um, uh, more of the commission members are here. Oh. Do, you, do you know if there's a, a time period where they need to have this to the Planning and Zoning Commission since this is an advisement to them for their consideration of the draft? Right, and I'm not certain what that time period is. Kim, do you know? On single family. Mm -hmm. Not on two families. Okay. So does anybody else have any comments as to how well this um, summarizes our concerns? Perhaps with the uh, the request that it might have elements of the the email that I'd sent out, just have them have a look at it. Did you all have a chance to look at Peter's email? And if anybody disagrees, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> It was uh, after the meeting. I think it was the day after, so it was February, uh, February 12th, I think. Yeah, I remember. I don't know if it, uh, it, my sense of it was it rang true. So. And it, and it did speak to the larger. Right, it did. Connection. So I think that's all. This is good for the specifics, but then just to, to have a more of a holistic um, introduction to it, even that just talks about the bigger picture goals that it should be working toward. But how would the council? I mean, how would the uh, the commission like to? You know, advance this. You know, I'm just thinking of an. You know, it, or do we want to act on it tonight, or is it something that? Um, or is it? Uh, a, is there a need? Is there a pressing need for us to? You know, act on it this evening. Um, not this evening. If you wanted to um, contact Erica tomorrow and. And Peter, if you want to send that along, I mean, if there's an agreement on the specifics on this, and then you might add what you said earlier, add that intent language about the more 
general aspects of this and if the commissioners are in, in agreement with that. And then she can um, make that, that a revision to this and then send it all out to you f to have a look at it. And, and w I think the intent of, of what's in here, whether for James or for myself in his absence, um, whether the commission supports us a letter to this with that change in the language, um, right. maybe that's all that we just need to get a, a feel on for tonight. Because if there's support for it, then right. uh, we'll execute it based on that. Mm -hmm. Because I know I can't wait until next month's meeting, mm -hmm. so it needs to happen probably this week or by early next week. Does this typically require a motion? Um, how did you all proceed when Dave Tremont and you were working with him on that landscaping and he had a similar letter? Did you all do it as a motion? I can't remember. Or was it just kind of a general agreement that you agreed with his? I, th I think, yeah, I think James just put together the. Yeah, it went as recommendations from us, but I don't know if he yeah. voted or not. Then perhaps it's an, enough tonight to say that, you know, it's a general agreement with um, Peter's added language to it. Yeah, I think we can say we can well agree with the content of the letter and we give a uh, free hand to Peter or James to refine it. That would be okay. I mean, at least for me, it's okay. I don't know how the other commission is. But... That'd be fine. So I, yeah. I, cause I, I certainly think that, you know, that Peter gets the sense of that things and mm -hmm. I'd be very comfortable with that. Any other um, reports or information? No, I, um, I just wanted to talk a bit more about the white spruce and how we're going to solve that problem. Um, but if, it, if they meet the specs, they meet the specs. I mean, well, you I, 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 about under, I mean, understand about the scraggly ones, but the scraggly ones don't meet the specs. But which specs are, uh, is that the new mass specs that you're talking about? Well, the, even ANSI standards, well, if it says three to five, it doesn't matter what kind of spruce it is, it's three to five, right? Right, but it may have this shape, which is the, you know, the three to five shape, but there may be three branches on either side, and ANSI doesn't address that. Well, there, there need to be specs. I mean, you, need, you have the specs for certain projects, and they need to address that. But they have to be. But that's what I'm saying. Um, the landscape architect specs don't normally address that. And so the only opportunity is to, for us to do it here. Um, what about the new mass specs? I don't know. I, I haven't even seen those yet. I mean, I think you we may need to review those in first. regards to this issue and then discuss it. Right. Have you, have you seen a mark? I have, and I can't, I can't recall. I have some. Right, because here, if it doesn't say anything more than the five to three, that's not going to get us any further than what we are now. There, there's quite a bit more in there. Okay. For the new specs, so I think it's worth checking them out. They used the Jim Flott presentation as part of the, um, and Jim Flott provided uh, specifications, and I think Mass is trying to incorporate those. At least okay. From. So I, I think that um, I have not seen them, but I think that was the intent. I have some of them here, I, but I did, I did look at them today, and I didn't think about spruce, but I agree we should be able to use white spruce. And, 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 I guess and if they I, don't look like Colorado spruce, that's because they're not, so... And I guess an underlying uh, question on this is that um, since it does refer to, to mass or another document or another um, specification which the contract is supposed to be held to, I'm uncomfortable adding another level of detail um, to those when those are what they should judge by. And if those aren't effective, are we the body to make them effective and can we? Um, it relates back to the unintended consequences that happened at uh, Clark, um, not Clark Middle School, Begich Middle School, where um, um, the Elise, you know, says mm -hmm. that because we were, you know, forced to go with the, these other trees, they were expensive trees from outside. So those, if we do move on something like this, sometimes there are unintended consequences. I don't believe that what Elise had said was, was accurate. I don't recall, I, I checked the minutes after she said that, and there was no indication that the uh, commission had had uh, required that effort. There was no discussion of it at all. But if that's a bad example, I still think that can always happen. Yeah. Where if we do get a little bit specific, um, that's just my fear. But I guess my question is, how do we prevent this from happening? Getting those very spindly white spruce. Enforcement. Yeah. MOA and DOT have. But to do we have specs that 
I mean, they can only enforce against the specifications. Well, they and do we have specifications that are going to, pre you know, that prevent that kind of tree? I don't think any existing spec should allow a, you know, 25 foot tall spindly um, birch tree with right. a really poor root zone uh, based upon ANSI. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But when it happened before, Patricia and I looked through ANSI and there's no nothing that addressed a tree like those birch trees. There's nothing in it to prevent that. Well, it's that in these now it says one half or more of the foliage should be on branches originating from the lower two thirds of the trunk. And where you, what, what's that coming this from? Mass. That's mass. Okay, but there is nothing in ANSI that pre would prevent those birch trees. No, but it, it refers to there should be specs because ANSI's not specs, and it refers to there should be specs for a street tree that says how far up the branching should be and things. So. Okay, fair enough. That's what about the white spruce? We still have to check that out then. Yeah, but if it it says they have to, you know, they have to be standard for the species. So. And th that's a very good comment because if it does refer a species standard, it's like a, just like a dog no, that, standard. And that, I mean, and there's no, I mean, to be frank, there's no code enforcement officer that's going to know what the standard is for a particular species. I, I, I would, uh, it depends on who's doing it with PM&E, &E, um, Isabel and uh, Brooke. And Isabel M. and Brooke will only review road projects. Well, Anything else besides other than the road projects like UAA that we just looked at tonight, it's going to be someone who, you know, they don't know a redwood from a lilac. Then I guess another question is this, you know, through our power, do we request that the landscape architect is given construction administration with one site visit? That would be a way to solve it too. I think writing it in here, if they don't know one from another, they're not going to know when they look at it that it meets this either. Yeah. So but the it, problem's beyond what, yeah. beyond it, what we should be putting in here. I think. Thinking outside of the box, if force enforcement is the issue on these private or uh, commercial projects or UAA or whatnot, as the enforcement is not going to happen, we have to request that it happens then. And it can, are we allowed to, as a body, say that the client will pay their landscape architect or someone with equivalent horticultural or arboricultural experience to inspect these trees prior to certificate of occupancy? Is that fair? Can we do that? I think that would be more complicated. I think it's easier to put it on our approval. So and it's there. I mean, they don't have any choice. And then it would be the, the guy, the MOA, when they do the final inspection to make sure it's according to our... But I think the issue is that MOA doesn't have inspectors that would know um, if it was planted upright. <laughs> well, and then the, 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 the... That's the problem. We can ask, we, then we can ask uh, the contractor or the owner to provide a certificate, you know, certificate from someone saying it is building according to the approved drawing. Uh, Sharon, my question for you to, to run up the flagpole would be is whether we can require that prior to certificate of occupancy right. that the site has been inspected by someone that knows. Mm -hmm. Someone should someone provide a letter or certification. Right. I don't know how we do that. We'd have to hire staff who are trained. No, it's, it's on, yeah. the on the client. To, on the client. On the client would have to do that. Yeah. They have to show that they have had someone with industry expertise. Because if it's a landscape architect or certified arborist, there are ethical reasons for them to actually report accurately. Could be one of your, your recommendations. Put the standard recommendation for all the cases. That's it. Just like structural, you know, third-party inspection or, you know, that, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know whether we can, because that would solve a lot of our problems. Yeah, it would off the bat. And, and that's, that's a good point. I mean, for every other part of the building that, you know, requires an, an inspection, it, uh, where it's mechanical, structural, electrical. My point is, if it is within the, your recommendation, the place approved with the start recommendation, they don't have any choice. There's no discussion. Mm -hmm. It's very really simple. Mm -hmm. How many providers of trees or shrubs and so forth are there in the Anchorage area? Many? Many. They, they order from outside. They're not true nurseries. I mean, we probably only have one or two true nurseries in Anchorage and up to the valley. The rest of them simply order plant material, put it on a, the parking lot, and then sell it. Well, uh, we talked about maybe at our next meeting if we have, since we don't have cases, having the municipal forester come. Maybe that's a conversation from him. And then 
I did want to encourage people to come next Wednesday and hear the presentation of management plan for Community Forest for Anchorage. That's project the State Division of Forestry funded, and it'll go to the city as recommendation, and it's funding an um, inventory and management plan, and the city forester will be taking public comment to do a, a more day-to-day -day kind of a plan for the city. So yeah. those are all good comments to give in relation to that. And I've, I've reviewed the draft, and it does address a lot of the things we've talked about in regard to maintenance and how much of, how much staff and how much money the city needs to be putting in to just catch up with the deferred maintenance or never done maintenance on the trees we already have. And it's mm -hmm. a little scary because we never had anyone take any responsibility for the trees once the city has them. So. But the, for, for more of those official projects, there also a substantial completion visit or certification. Someone needs to certify, you know, architect, engineer, go there, they do the substantial completion inspection in the royal era to the owner. That's the way it goes so all the and time. people say that they do that, but they sign off on anything mm -hmm. they don't know. Oh, and then that will be the professionals do, you know. If there's a conditions or recommendation and he certifies something is, is all right, mm -hmm. it's his problem. And I think more specifically within that, if, um, you know, if we all have the chance to review mass and whether, you know, oh, bow to Patricia from a horticultural point of view, but if she feels that the current mass does meet good planting requirements, then what we can add to this for any case that we see and really any case in the, or any, any project that we don't see in the city is that they have to, planting materials have to meet ANSI and mass, and the client has to have a um, landscape architect or certified arborist um, certify that the plantings have been installed per ANSI and mass and the drawings. I would love it if we were able to do that. I can't. Jim Plott, the contractor that's doing the management plan and did the training on writing specs, he reviewed the other mass. But tomorrow I'll send him okay. the new one and say, look at the new one and see. Then if that's our benchmark, I, then it just happens in the first comment, you know, shall state that it meets ANSI and uh, mass. It could become, a, you know, the, another boilerplate, boilerplate uh, condition. Um, I just want to mention you all, if you get a chance to uh, look at the new mass specifications, I think Patricia said they're on the uh, Muni website, are they under the, what, where did you find it? I just put in where it said find something, I just put in mass. municipal, well, I wrote in municipal, you municipality of Anchorage <laughs> standard specifications and I got some choices and one of them was January 2009, so. Okay, so that pretty much hot, hot to off the pass. Email the link. Oh, yeah, I can send you, you can, the link. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Send it to me, too. Um, I'll download it and put it in a binder. It'll be uh, at afternoon tomorrow, not in the morning. Any other announcements or information? <clears throat> Just to follow up on our letter, letter about Begich Middle School, I did revise that, and I passed it on to James. He's reviewing it during his break. And... Uh, so hopefully we'll wrap that up the next meeting. Anything else? Mm. Just want to um, uh, uh, bring Commissioner's attention to a handout that um, I provided. Uh, this is an intro. I, I came across this. I thought it was a you know, pretty interesting little article just talking about urban design you know, and um, sort of the evolution of the concept of urban design and um, between landscape architects and architects and um, you know, planners, and um, you know, particularly the the notion of you know landscape urbanism, uh, and um, you know, how it kind of all blend together to um, you know try to create a better sense of place you know for um, for people, and you know, I think it's directly relevant to what we're doing uh, here, especially as we've had some discussion regarding. Uh, some of these uh, uh, design elements, I mean, like neighborhood gateways and uh, you know, other vertical features that are n not necessarily trees uh, or shrubs, uh, but that um, you know, as uh, Dwayne Adams from uh, Land Design North you know, stated this evening, he considers those you know, a legitimate uh, uh, landscape 
uh, elements uh, to be under, and within the purview of the uh, you know uh, the existing ordinance and um, open to review and comment you know by the urban design uh, commission. So I just want to kind of you know put that out there you know, for people to be thinking about how everything kind of fits together you know, and you know how can we as a commission um, you know contribute to furthering that sense of a stronger sense of place for the various. Uh, uh, distinct you know, geographical areas uh, here in in our community. It's just food for thought. That's what I'm trying to do. I hope you guys are hungry. Always hungry. Um, <laughs> with that, uh, motion to adjourn. Second. Need to adjourn. Don't need a second. I'm just asking for the motion. No, I'm not.